the heart of this church is that each one of us are joined together for a purpose. For a purpose. And that purpose is to reach others with the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And it is to, I'm going to carry that right on, because as we reach others, God doesn't want us to live without. God wants us to live this life that is so fulfilled, that is so satisfying, that is so full of of his presence and his ability that, and Brendan reminded me of this today, I don't think I even meant to say this last week, but it came out and he said somebody brought this up and so I'll say it again, is he wants you to be such a sight that people want to know what is going on with that person. What is going on with them? I don't get it. Bad things happen in their life and they're as happy as ever. I look at Heather and Heather is the, the you know, walking billboard of this. I've seen Heather go through challenges this, this past year, and I see this smile on her face bigger than ever. It's because the presence of God is all over that girl, and God is working on the inside of her. See, there are things that, that when God begins to work inside of us that you can't help but say, that's real. And people around you go, that's real. I don't know what's going on inside of her, but that's real. And that's what we want to be is a church that is real. We don't want to be, let's, let's play church and let's, let's have this nice three-point sermon and let's have Sunday school and, and let's just go back to our lives the way they were during the week. You know, the Word of God is supposed to change us so that when we leave this place, that you're not the same. That when you leave here, it impacts how you go out there. That when you walk out of this door, that you have something, and I'm going to call this the revelation of God, that bubbles up inside of you, and it, it starts coming out in every area of your life. It's real. You can't get away from it. And so today, as we get into the Word here, that's my heart, you guys, is that the Word comes alive. Because this book... Um, it's not a rule book. And we're going to learn more about this today, but I'm going to call this a two-rule book. That might sound funny, but it's not a book of rules. It's a book to rule. And we're going to learn more about that today. But this is life to you. Do you know that every one of you, this is life to you? If you're born again, that inside of you was created in the image of God. And this God left us so we can uncover every great and precious promise he has for us. So we can feed that inner man on the inside so he can be strong. So we can face all those challenges and be real and go, wow, that didn't even faze me. That just went right off my back. That's the power of the word at work in our life. So Psalm 103. Let's, let's read from verse 1. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your iniquities, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from destruction, and who crowns you with loving kindness and tender mercies. Now, we're going to stop there because we've been going through this line by line, verse by verse, because I wanted to talk about the benefits that are here. Because he says, forget not all his benefits. And then he goes on to list them. So we're on the one, the second half of verse 4, who crowns you with loving kindness and tender mercy. Now, before I go on from there, did you guys know this whole psalm, if I read this whole psalm to you today, it's about your identity. It's about who you are. But now you might sound funny because if I read through there, it's like everything about this whole thing is pretty much from God's perspective. And I want to share something with you. This might um, seem strange too. But you guys probably all know that David, King David in the Bible, wrote almost every one of the Psalms. Well, this Psalm was written at a particular time in his life that might have a little bit of, of impact here when we talk about it. Because um, for all of you guys here... Um, Set this around here because this is a little tight here. Um, for all of you guys here, uh, this was the time in David's life when um, he had been the fighting dude going out with the army. And 
the army said, hey, you're the king now. You should stay home. You should just chill, rest. You know, we're going to give you a break. So he's home, and I picture it this way. David's bored out of his mind. Now, here's the thing. I don't know. I didn't look this up. How many wives David has? I have one. That's plenty, guys. I, I, I don't know about all of you, but one is plenty. And David had all these wives, and he went up to the top of his roof, and he looks off in the distance, and there's this beautiful young lady bathing on the top of her roof. Now, most guys would think, oh, you know, can't look, not right. But David kept looking. And you guys probably all know the rest of the story here. It's, it's, her name's Bathsheba. And this was not a stellar time in David's life. David messed up royally. He not only had what we'd call today an affair with this lady, because she was married, he also sent her husband out to the front lines so he could get rid of him. And he snuck this behind everybody. But God didn't let that go unnoticed. God sent this, this guy to him, and it's what I was just talking about earlier. It's God gave this guy a word. His name was Nathan the prophet. And Nathan the prophet came, David, and he began to tell David, you know, this story. What would you do? And he went through this whole story. If this happened, this happened, this happened, what would you do to this guy? And David's like, man, I'd kill him. He died, doesn't deserve to live. And Nathan goes, it's you! <laughs> and here's David, just got caught with the worst thing that he could possibly do, right? He's murdered a guy, took his wife, and he snuck around behind everybody's back, and he's king of the land, supposed to be the leader, and he did all this. And do you know what he wrote? That psalm. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul. Now, Larry, that might sound really strange. But you know, Sometimes in the worst possible place in our lives, we have to let it come out of our mouths what we believe inside of our heart. We have to stir up what God's placed inside of us. And we're going to go on here. Sorry, I didn't mean to get off on a tangent and preach this, but this is all about God and what he's doing for man. David, at his worst moment, writes this, and it was a song. David was like Katie. David had a harp, and he's playing, and this song came out. Now, I think that's an amazing thing, because it tells what is really inside of this man's heart. So today, we're going to talk about that one verse there, because David used this word crowned over and over and over through the Psalms. And what in the world does this mean? And I said this, it has to do with our identity, who we are, who we are. And who we are is found inside the Lord Jesus Christ. And that might sound a funny statement to you guys, but if the Bible says that, Molly, you are a new creature in Christ Jesus. Molly, when she accepted the Lord Jesus, a new creation that had never before been seen, Somebody that never existed, a miracle that didn't exist before, a wonder, came into existence. First time ever been seen. In Jesus. So our identity, who we are, is not just Molly Helgren, the blonde girl who went to Iowa State, who, you know, I believe has a psychology degree, is that right? No. Human services, okay, well, that's close. <laughs> and her identity is not what she does or those things. Her identity is in the Lord Jesus Christ. So our identity is tied up in this verse. Now, this thing, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to grab this because, okay, for those of you who don't know, I was a children's pastor for a number of years, so I have to have my props. And just be glad I don't pick on you too. <laughs> Believe me, they can all tell you. Um, so I have my crown here that we're going to talk about today. But the crown designates royalty, right? So, you know, today it might be the Queen of England, it might be the King of Spain or the King of Saudi Arabia or something, you know. 
and they wear something like this. It's a symbol of the position they hold, of the authority that they have in that position. And today, I would like to have Connor and Katie come up here, please. So we're going to illustrate a little, see if I can um, explain this. Because somebody who wears a crown is a leader there to rule and reign. So I want you guys to, to listen to my little story here, and, and then we're going to uh, demonstrate this. So, so we have right here um, regular girl Katie from small town Minnesota, who's dreamed her whole life of meeting Prince Charming. <laughs> <laughs> and so Connor, Prince Connor, <laughs> comes into her path, and it's, he's everything she's ever dreamed of. Now, I know this is a big stretch, but, but <laughs> well, not the handsome prince part, but I know this is a big stretch of what I'm going to say, but um, so Connor is really taken with Katie, too, and he proposes and asks her to marry him. Big stretch, right? As if you don't know the two of them are getting married. Um, so here's Mr. Handsome Prince. And he, he's going to get married. But at the same time, you guys, he is going to succeed to the throne. The throne of, we'll call it McGee land. So, so there's a big ceremony. There's a big celebration. And, you know, if you guys have ever seen this happen, it's probably some officiant that comes up and they, they say all these words and then they come up and they, he bows down and they place the... The crown on his head, and then everybody bows down and, oh, hail King Connor of Magellan! Yeah. Now, here's the next step, though. So, we have another part of the ceremony. They're going to get married. So, we go through and do all the vows, and this would be a practice for me if I really had to do this, but um, by the power pronounced, uh, invested in me, I now pronounce you, man, see, I can't even say it right. By the power invested in me, I now pronounce you man and wife, but we won't practice the kiss here today. So, um, but, so, <laughs> King Connor, now you may crown your queen. <laughs> now, see, after he was crowned and he became the king, he had the authority to crown his queen, right? Not until it was after. Does that fit okay, Katie? They're round. Like, yeah. Okay. <laughs> so now I present to you the king and queen of McGeeland. You guys can have a seat, but I don't, don't let the crowns go far. Connor, you, you don't have to wear it the whole time. But you're going to come back later, and we're going to illustrate something a little bit farther on this. So you guys... Now, this is a regular girl, right, that we just brought up here, and she was crowned the queen of McGee land. She was recognized to have an ability to lead, to rule, to reign, to exercise authority. Now, these are some funny words, but I want to get all this out there for you. And so all of that happens when that crown was placed on her head. That's a symbol of what happens, you know, this is that position that she's in. So this place in Psalms 103 that we read, we read, this says that we're crowned with two things. We're crowned with loving kindness and tender mercies. And I'm going to explain both of those to you in just a second. But I, before I go there, I want to tell you this word crown. Because it's pretty simple. You know, Connor, he's not going to take that crown off, you guys. I've, I've created a monster <laughs> over here. And this is probably going to uh, make it on social media that we have King Connor of McGeeland. Oh, it's probably handsome King Connor of McGeeland. That's probably what it is. Um, but anyway, there's three things that when I look this word up, crowns, that crowns means. And I want you guys to hear this because I want to talk about you, to you a little bit about this today. That word crowns means to encircle or surround. Okay, Larry, big tail. Well, it means to be encircled or surrounded with love and the tender, loving kindness and tender mercies. It means to be protected by the love of God. So we're going to dig into that in just a minute. But then there's one more. It says that this also means a compass. 
Um, Rachel, you're a hiker, right? Yeah. So if you go out into the woods in Colorado, do you ever go without a compass? No. no. So you take your compass because you want to be able to find the direction that you're supposed to go to get back to where you started from, probably, or to find what you're looking for. That compass gives you direction. So this word actually means direction. We're going to talk about that in a little bit, too. And the last one is recognizing the ability to rule and reign. So that's what this word crown means. So before we jump into that, though, I want to talk to you about these words, loving kindness and tender mercies. Now, in the past um, probably a couple months, we talked about the covenant that God has with us. And there's a word um, from the Old Testament called hased, and I don't pronounce that very well. If I was, if I was Hebrew, it would be hased, something like that, while well, I spit at Brian again and, and make that word come out. But that word is a cutting of covenant, a joining together, a completeness of unity with someone. And I won't reteach that whole thing about covenant today, but that word has said is a covenant love. And God actually joins himself to us. That's the love that's talked about here. It's really, um, you guys, it's who he is. You guys have probably all read this. God is love, right? I, I, can't, I can't grasp that, honestly. So, you know, um, if I said um, Kayla is a woman, that makes sense. God is, Lord is our God. But if I said Kayla is um, love, there's a disconnect here. I don't, I don't see how she could be that because love is this feeling and expression that we get. That's how we think of love, right? How can God be, he is love? But that's who he is. It's so intrinsic to his character that you can't separate him from that. There's no separation of that. So that's what this word loving kindness is. And, you know, I could, I could go on and talk about this, that, you know, from the New Testament, um, let, me, let me just read this to you. You don't have to look this up. It's Romans 8, 37. We are more than conquerors through him who loved us. And I'm persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. Nothing can separate us. That's this kind of love that God has for us, that we're inseparable from him. We're joined with him. He is love. We're joined with him. So we're joined with him in this bond of love. And there's one more thing here in that verse that we talked about that's, that's tender mercies. Sorry this is kind of teaching you guys because I want to lay this all out here before I kind of pull it together for you. Tender mercies is compassion. It's a restoring love to show tender concern. It's like, um, I watched Sarah Lynn over here with Landon. You know, she has tender love for her son. You know, she cares for him deeply. Watch other moms, and I'm, I'm going to say it this way. If you guys ever want to see the opposite of tender mercies, um, get in between a mom and their child, and you will see the total opposite of tender mercy because a mom will defend their kid to the very end. And tender mercy is that tender love that a mother shows for their child. So I want to explain this, though, because there's two things that are in this verse. Loving kindness and tender mercies. Okay, Larry, big deal. Well, let me see if I can tell you a story to kind of put this together for you. Brenda and I went to Ireland last fall. It was the trip of a lifetime. We, we had the most wonderful time. And we stayed in people's homes, um, bed and breakfast. And one of the bed and breakfasts we stayed at, um, this lady's name was Mary Fitzgerald. And Mary and her family um, had lived on, well, Mary had lived there, but her family had lived there for um, 450 years on this land. It, it belonged to them. The family kept passing it down, passing it down. And, and they had this huge um, farm for Ireland's purposes. It was like, I don't know, three, 400 acres. And on the farm, they had something that we'd read about this, and we had no idea what it was, but it was called a fairy ring fort. I, I know. It sounds really strange, but it, it was a ring fort, and then there, the folklore in that time called it a fairy ring fort. But this thing, 
Um, so she walked us out one night to see this ring fort, and we're like, we had no idea what we were even going to see out here. Well, we walked a ways, and she began to tell us about, about what this was. Well, back in, I think it was like the 1200s, um, in Ireland there were clans, and the McGees would have been a clan. Um, so the clans um, in that area of Ireland, they created a fort where they, every night they went in for safety. And it wasn't a fort like from the Wild West, you know, that we know a fort, because in that area there were no rocks, and if you saw this area of Ireland, there's not many trees. It's just this rolling grassy hills as far as you can see. So what did they do to build this fort? Well, what they did was they dug a ditch that was probably, I don't know, be 15, 16 feet deep. And it was farther than I could jump across. Maybe Brendan could jump across it. Mr. Longjumper could probably jump across it. But um, it, was, it was wide and deep. And inside that was this circle where they built their houses. And they created their own little village inside this circle. And they had a drawbridge back in that time that they lowered the drawbridge over that ditch and it went down so they could cross. Well, so she's telling us this story. Well, we get there and there's two ditches. And I'm like, well, what's the second ditch for? And she goes, oh. Well, the outer ring, and this outer ring was maybe 25, 30 feet deep, and it went around the outside of the other one, and there was a deeper ditch on the outside of it. And I said, well, what was that part for? And she said, oh, they brought the animals in to the outer ring every night, and they pulled the drawbridge up. So the animals couldn't come in to where they were sleeping, they had to stay in the outer ring because they couldn't cross that ditch either. And they were safe from the wolves or, or marauding clans, I don't know. But so it was safety. It was protection. So this, this ring fort, though, had two rings because if they made it into the first ring, all of the animals started making noise. And it woke the people up in the center ring so they would know something's going on and they could get up and fight off whatever had had invaded. So my story here, you guys, is this verse that we just read has two rings. It's loving kindness and tender mercy. And I want to see if I can explain this to you why this is important. Because I just kind of described to you God's love. God's love never fails us. God's love's with us forever. We read that, that, that his love never forsakes us, will never be separated from it. We're more than conquerors in his love. His love is an amazing amazing thing that we just I don't know that I can even begin to comprehend. But then there's right after it is mercy. And why is this mercy there? Well it's because you guys God knows who we are. I'm going to prove this to you. Will you turn in Psalms you're still at that verse I'm going to read a little farther here and I want you to look at verse 8. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in mercy. He will not always strive with us, nor will he keep his anger forever. He has not dealt with us according to our sins, nor punished us according to our iniquities. For as the heavens are high above the earth, so great is his mercy towards those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. As a father pities his children, so the Lord pities those who fear him. Now listen to this last verse. For he knows our frame. He remembers that we are dust. I got to paint this picture to you because mercy God puts out there because every one of us, if, you, if you're in here and you tell me this isn't true, then um, I'm probably uh, going to have to sit down and really talk to you seriously and pray because you're probably not very truthful with yourself or me. But if you say you've never sinned in your entire life, you've never messed up, you've never made a mistake, then I think you've got something serious going on. Because every one of us living on this, and I'm going to call it this big round piece of dirt called earth, we have inside of us the nature of sin. 
I can't take that out of it. I couldn't reach into Stephen and say, Stephen, I want that. And I'm going to pull the nature of sin right out of him, and he never has to deal with it again. It won't work that way. It'll never work that way. I can't do that for any one of you in here. God can't do that for you either. What he did with his son was he came and he gave you a new man on the inside so you can rule over that nature of sin. But you have that inside of you. You can't get away from it. It will always be there. And here's what I'm going to say. Because you're created from dirt. You have, it says it right there. God knows us. God knows what we're made of. So this word mercy that he's got in there, tender mercies, is because he knows that, sorry, Brendan, i got to pick on you because you're right up front. Brendan's going to mess up. And actually, if Brendan's anything like his dad, probably at least uh, before he goes to bed tonight, he'll mess up in some way. You know, it's, it's just that's who we are. Come on, every one of us is like that. We make mistakes. You know, this week I had a challenge with somebody that I said something I shouldn't have said to, and I had to go back and apologize because I was an idiot. And if any one of you say that doesn't happen to you, come on. It's the truth. We make mistakes because we are made from, what's it say? Dust. We have the nature that came from this place that we live on. He knows what you're made of. So mercy is there. Now let me get you this because this is great. Mercy is there to bring you back. Mercy, just like I said, is a, a mama, the way she loves her child. Come here, baby. You know, I know you fell and hurt your knee, but, but come up on my lap and we'll make this all better. God's mercy is always reaching out. And the definition I gave you of this is mercy is a restoring love. Yes. Mercy is always looking past the mistakes you've made and saying, come back. Come back. I, I got to share this. This is maybe an illustration of mercy because um, I know there's a few of you in here that work out. And me being a 58-year-old old fart, I'm trying to work out. I had somebody tell me this week to... to um, do what's hard, Larry, not what's, what's um, just, is that how he said it? You don't always do um, what's easy, Larry. you got to do what's hard. And I'm like, yeah, working out is really hard. It hurts. And my body doesn't like it. But so i got to give you a picture of this. I picture God in his mercy like this. So you go to the gym, and you're going to lift. Now, for you ladies, this might be pertinent too, but for the guys, you know, if you're going to lift and Sorry, I have to suck it in and pull it up. And, well, I'm saying this because, you know, the older you get, everything up here kind of sags down a little bit. <laughs> and you want to keep those things so they're not sagging down a little bit. So <laughs> when you go to the gym, you want to do some bench press so you can, can work those things. And so if I'm picturing God like a workout bed, and God's standing behind you while you're doing the bench press, and you're reaching that place where your arms are just noodled out and you can't hardly get another one. And God's, God's saying to you, come on, I know you can do it. You put another one in there. Come on, you got it. Push through. Come on, we can do this. Come on, come on, come on. And you start up, this, oh, and you get halfway up and the bar starts dropping. And God catches it. And he pulls it off and sets it aside. And he says something to you that's telling of his character. Because he doesn't say, you stupid weakling, what's the matter with you? Why couldn't you do that? <laughs> God's words to you in that moment. <laughs> God's words to you in that moment. Hey, that's okay. You did amazing today. And next time you're going to get that. Next time, we're going to do it together. That's mercy, you guys. That's mercy. See, there's a difference between God's love and his mercy. So this says that we've got both of them working. So I want to start and talk to you just a little bit then about where we go from here, understanding that verse. And let me see if I can jump into this here. <laughs> because I think I just skipped around in all my notes. 
I want to talk to you just a second about protection. Because, and that sounded really bad, <laughs> but um, <laughs> yeah, I'm like, visions of sixth grade sex education class, I'm like, no! <laughs> yeah. Gosh, Larry. <laughs> We talked about the ring fort and how you had to get across both of those. God's mercy and his love is a protecting force in our lives. I want to take you one place, and this is going to be a really strange verse to go to. I want you guys to turn to Lamentations. And there's a reason I want you to go there. And if you don't know where it's at, find Jeremiah and you'll find it. Lamentations 3.22. Find it, Jake. All right. Oh, digital. He's got it easy. <laughs> Lamentations 322. I'm going to go ahead and read this. Through the Lord's mercies we are not consumed. His, his compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. I'm going to read that one more time. Through the Lord's mercies we are not consumed. Because his compassions fail not. They are new every morning. I'm going to read you one other verse, because when I grew up, okay, this is a song we sang like every other Sunday, and from some of you older folks in here, if I say, the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases, his mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning, great is his faithfulness. I'm going to say that, that translation one more time. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases, his mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning great is his faithfulness. This verse has the same things that we looked at in Psalms together. Love and mercy. But this gives us this picture, you guys, because I, I kind of laid this out of what mercy is. But this says that mercies are new every day. So let's say, uh, I'll pick on Rachel because she's my, my sister. I can pick on her. Let's say Rachel messes up before she gets home. <laughs> <laughs> And she asked God forgiveness, and God's merciful. Now, did she use up the mercy so that tomorrow morning when she gets out of bed and hollers at Mary and messes up, that there's no mercy to be found? It's new. Every morning, just the same way the sun comes up every day, and probably the way most of you brew your coffee every day, it's new every morning. Every morning. It's new. It recharges. His mercies are ready for us to mess up. No. Larry, does that give me permission? No. It's not a permission to mess up, but he says he knows what you're made of. He covers us. He protects us. He, he has a covering around us called love and mercy. So that no matter how far we get out and we go, oh, why did I do that? His mercy is right there to bring us back. Amen? So that's the protection. Now I want to talk about the next definition, what was the compass. Sorry. That will never be outlived, I'm sure. Um, the next one is compass or direction. Can you guys turn to Proverbs 3, 5? This verse I'm going to read is probably, if you walk into any Christian bookstore or um, see any line Christ online Christian service, you've probably seen this verse a zillion times. Um, let me read it here. Trust in the Lord with all your heart 
and lean not to your own understanding. I don't even have to look at my Bible to say the rest of this one. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he shall direct your paths. Can I read it one more time? Because we know, we've all heard it. Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he will make straight your paths. So there's a word in here, you guys, that I want to talk about a little bit. It's called acknowledge. But before we get there, I want to tell you some of the other words in there, because I love words. I love how you can break them down and you can understand what the Bible says. So there's a word in here that says, lean not to your own understanding. Now, get what this means. It means to lean on your own abilities. Now, we've translated it out to say, lean not to your own understanding, or lean not to your own abilities, trust in yourself, rely on yourself only. Now, let me go on. There's a word down here that is direct, to make straight or even, pleasing, good, pleasant, prosperous, to show you the right way to go. That's direct. And the last one I said I would bring up is the word acknowledge. You know, there's a verse in Hosea that says, my people perish for lack of knowledge. And in the Bible, you guys, I just want to make sure that you all hear this and understand this, that when we read the Bible, some of it's hard for us to get. It's hard for us to sit down and, uh, and this is the best word I can give you, is decipher the code. Come on, you guys all feel that way, I'm sure. You read something and you go, I don't quite get that, but I've heard this in church before, so okay, it's true, I know that, but I don't get it. And that's not where God wants us to stay. God doesn't want us to stay to the place where we don't have a good understanding of what the Word tells us, because the Word is life. And when we uncover the life that's in the Word of God, it changes us on the inside. So we've got to have an understanding of what those words mean. So this word that my people perish for lack of knowledge is the same word that's here in Proverbs. It's translated acknowledge. Now this word acknowledge is, now get this, is to know by experience. I met Roger, how long ago, Roger? About two and a half years ago, maybe. Had no idea who this dude was. He comes in, you know, a uh, bald man that played the drums. <laughs> and I was a keyboard player at our church at the time. And the way the, the platform was set up, the keyboard was right back here, and the drums were right beside me. And so during the service, Roger couldn't hear much of what was going on, so he'd lean over and go, Hey, what's going on? Can you tell me? <laughs> And that, that's my first experiences with Roger. And we started going to practice together and got to know each other. Now, you, you heard the word I used, experience. I knew nothing of Roger. I, I didn't know that this is a man who has a great heart, that he loves Jesus with everything that's inside of him. See, I had to experience getting to know Roger to really know who the man is. This word right here is to know the Lord Jesus by experience. He doesn't want you to go sit in church and, okay, I got to know about God. This is the most boring thing I've ever heard, but I know I'm supposed to know about God. That's not what he wants. He wants you to have a vibrant, active experience with him. You know, Brenda and I have been married 27 years this fall. Okay. <laughs> if we never interacted together, how long do you think our marriage would last? If I didn't have an experience with my wife, you know, that, that we interacted, shared activities, did things together, you know, it's a knowing her that our love grows. That's the way it is with the Lord Jesus. You've got to have an active experience with him to, for that love inside of you to grow, for him to become bigger inside of you. And that's what this word here means, is to know him by experience. Now, I want to, I want to go on from here, because 
I, I brought this up in this, that he's going to direct your path. He's going to show you the right way to go. Okay, today in society, what's good and what's right, everybody says is subjective. You guys ever heard that word? You know, um, Danielle, what's right to you is different from what's right to Kayla. What's right with Jeff is different from what's right with Lee. That's subjective. That there's no right or wrong, that every one of us can have our own right. But is that what God says? See, God says that there... Uh, I'm going to read this because I'm going to mess it up to say it right. <laughs> Sorry, I have to find this here. There seems, there is a way that seems right to a man, and it ends in destruction. That's from the word. There is, is a way that seems right to a man, and it ends in destruction. Now, that's not just talking about eternal. You know, Stephen decided he's going to turn his back on the Lord and never go to church and never do anything, have anything to do with God again. He's smiling. I know that would never happen. But <laughs> <laughs> Then we could all say, well, Stephen's headed for destruction. And, and we would, you know, I don't know, I'm not going to get into the once saved, always saved thing here today, but, you know, um, that's beside the point. It's if somebody turns their back on God and walks away and never knows him, that they're headed for destruction. We could all agree on that. But what about the person who doesn't follow God's direction in their life? See, that, that verse I just read you, there is a way that seems right to a man that ends in destruction, is not just talking about Stephen's eternity. It's talking about Stephen following every day after the Lord Jesus Christ with everything that's inside of him. Being directed by what God says. Not doing things his own way. That's this verse that we're just studying out. Not doing things our own way. Would you guys turn with me to Proverbs 29, 18? My New King James reads this way. There, where there is no revelation, the people cast off restraint. Well, let me read you a newer translation. that says, where there is no vision, the people perish. I like that. Where there is no vision. Because a vision has to do with seeing where we're going or where we want to be. I don't know if any of you have talked with Katie and Connor lately, but um, I think we were meeting before church today, and the latest was, what are the pots and pans that we're going to pick out? <laughs> um, Connor got to, they're having plaid suits. I'm not going to say tuxes for their wedding. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, they're, they're, they're nice. But so, <laughs> yeah, King Connor over there. So, but they have a vision of what they want their wedding to be. They have a vision, they just found an apartment, of what they want their home to be. They see ahead, and they're taking steps to make that happen. That's a vision. And you know, this word vision, because the, the King James I read was the word revelation. And it's a little bit different than vision, because a revelation is something becoming real to you. Um, trying to look around and see who I can pick on because I'm probably go right back to Roger because I know I can pick on Roger, but Roger had a revelation a long time ago that Harleys were the most amazing motorcycle. You know, that was a revelation. They're real. They're wonderful. They're amazing. And he rides them all the time now. It became real inside of him that Harleys are the way to go. A revelation is something that becomes real down deep inside of you. And without a revelation, something that is actively becoming real to you, this verse says that the people perish. That they are headed for destruction. You know, I could give you a whole bunch of other words that go with that. But I want to 
I want to flip that around and talk to you just the flip side of that. Because every one of you in here today was created to really live in God's ability. Now to do that, I've kind of hinted around to this, you have to be directed or fed by what's in here. And I'm going to read to you Isaiah 55. If you want to write this down, you can, because I don't want to turn there because of time. But God is speaking and, and says here, listen to me and eat what is good. Come to me and hear, and your inner man shall live. I want to talk to you today just for a second here about this. We're talking about direction. If you want to get God's direction, if you want to acknowledge him, if you want to know him in a deeper way, if you want that place where I know where I'm going, I have a vision, I have a revelation of what's ahead for me, how do you get that? How do you get that? The way you get that, you guys, is you've got to feed what's inside here. Because this verse I read you just a couple of minutes ago, that my people perish for lack of knowledge of knowing him. The only way you know him and get to know him in a deeper way is you've got to feed your spirit. I think there's a verse in Timothy that says, that says you, you should nourish through the words of faith. And, you know, you guys have probably all heard this too. I think it's in Hebrew and Peter. It says, you know, um, drink the sincere milk of the word and you're not ready for meat. It, it likens everything. I don't, I don't see cookies in the word, but, you know, if, if Luann had been alive when Jesus wrote this word, there'd definitely be cookies in the word. <laughs> Thank you for the amazing cookies, Luann. Um, but it talks to us about feeding. Now, I don't know. I'm, I'm going to stand up here, and I won't talk about the, the, this around my middle because I don't really have a problem staying um, away from food. <laughs> Food's like calls my name, and food is really easy to shove in my mouth because it tastes good, and I like it. I want it. I don't want to be away from it. And especially cookies. <laughs> That's what the Word of God is supposed to be like to us. We're supposed to have a hunger for the things of God. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. We're supposed to have this inside of us that we, we long to come to be with Jesus, to spend that time with him, to get to know him, to experience him. And you know what happens from that? He directs you. Because, now this is the funny thing I'm going to twist back around to, is everything that we do with the Lord Jesus, everything. Remember I said this is not a book of, what did I call this, a book of what? Rules. It's not a book of rules. It's not a book of rules. It's not like a rule book that you're going to look to play a board game. Whoops. It's not a... a a uh, book of rules that tells you the right and wrong way to do things. And yes, there is a right way. But you know what this tells us? It tells us how to love him. It draws us to a place of loving him deeper. And when we love him deeper, that direction happens naturally in your life. It's not something you've got to strive for. It's not so, that's something you've got to, oh, what does God want me to do? I don't know. It just happens naturally. As you're in prayer, as you're in the Word, as you give Him priority in your life, He'll direct you. So I've given you these two now. Of he protects us and He directs us. Now I want to talk to you just a minute about the last one, and we'll wrap up today. Because the last one had to do with those crowns that we had out, the crowns over here. And it has to do with ruling and reigning. I want you guys to turn one more place with me today as you can turn to Romans 5.17. Romans 5.17. Now, I gave you the definition of what the crown stood for is that it means to rule and reign or have the ability to rule and reign. 
But what does it mean, you guys, for us as Christians to rule and reign? And I got to ask this because um, I'm, I made up a kingdom for Connor and Katie. It's McGee land. You know, we have the kingdom of McGee land. What is it the kingdom that you guys are supposed to reign in? Let me, before we read this, this verse, I want to read to you from Luke. It says in Luke 17, 20, that the kingdom of God is within you. Now, this is going to sound really strange, but you know the word kingdom that's, that's translated in the New Testament lots and lots of places is the same word rule and reign. So the ability, I'm going to say it this way, inside of Barry, the ability to rule and reign is in him. Because God says the kingdom of God is within you. It's inside of you. It's inside of you. It's inside of every one of us here that know Jesus. The, the ability to rule and reign is inside of you. But where are we supposed to reign? Because it's inside of the kingdom. That I'm, I'm kind of contradicting myself here. Is that the kingdom isn't where we reign inside. Where are we supposed to reign? That's where we want to look at this Romans 5.17. Romans 5.17. For if by one man's offense death reigned through the one, much more those who receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness will reign in life through the one Jesus Christ. Let me read it one more time. I probably read too fast. For if by the one man's offense death reigned through the one, much more those who receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness will reign in life through one Christ Jesus. You guys, who is it that receives the abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness? Who is it? Is it us? It's every one of us. Every believer received those gifts freely. So if we got it, then it says right on farther there, that they will reign in what? In what? So you are called. Now this is, I'm going to, you know, this is like, okay, Larry, is, what is this? Is we Sunday school? Are we going to, what are we talking about here? Reign in your life. Okay, big deal. What does it mean? What does it mean to me? What does it mean that I can reign in my own life? Well, let me ask you a statement or ask you a question. If you don't rule your own life, if you don't lead your own life, if you don't move your life ahead, does life still happen? I'm going to make a statement to you that if you don't rule your life, life will rule you. One more time. If you don't rule your life, life will rule you. Now, come on. Every one of us has, the same way we were talking earlier about we mess up, we make mistakes. As long as you live on this earth, stuff happens, life happens. Um, our, our riding lawnmower blew up this week. And we have close to three acres to mow. Um, so I can go, ah, oh, this is the most horrible thing that ever happened in my life. That's what I'm going to do. Or I can say, praise God. God has this in hand. He knows how to take care of every one of my needs, and he's going to take care of this for us. Now, which one of those is ruling and reigning? See, you have a choice every day. When circumstances, issues, things happen to you, are you going to let life rule you, or are you going to rule life? Every word that's in this book is true, and it belongs to you. You are joined with the Lord Jesus in love and mercy. His love surrounds you like that fort. It, there's rings around you. Nobody can get to you when you stay inside of there. If I had an umbrella today, I should have brought it with me. I used to teach this in children's church. You put the umbrella up, and you're underneath of it, and you can't get rained on, but you step out from under it, and you're going to get wet. When you're inside God's covering his circle of love and mercy, when you stay there, he's got you protected, he gives you direction, and he gives you the ability to reign. Now, this might sound really silly, you guys, because I'm giving you a contradiction, maybe, that 
you're supposed to, to find God's direction, but then you're supposed to take charge. I don't like the word take charge. I like the word lead. Because you're supposed to lead your own life. You're supposed to be the one. And, oh, Larry, it doesn't say in the word. It says in Romans that all things work together for the good of those who are in Christ Jesus. I can just let everything happen to me and it's going to work out just fine. Isn't that right? Yeah, I was about ready to say, <laughs> no, that's not true. God gave you all the authority. The Bible says that, and, and I wish I had this verse written down, that Jesus said, all authority has been given to me, and now all authority I give to you. You're his representative here on the earth. You're here to live out his life. You're here to be an example. Like I said about Heather earlier, what's wrong with that girl? Why is she so happy all the time? I don't get it. That's what we're supposed to be. We're supposed to rule and reign and lead our own life. Because if we just let things happen to us, come on. The devil is going to have a heyday with you. He's going to attack you from every side. And you know what? Uh, people, um, I don't know about you guys, but people can get under your skin. And without that love and that mercy that God has all over us, we start making a mess out of our lives when we start dealing with people and not having God in the midst of that. So he wants you to rule and reign. Now, I want to bring Connor and Katie back up here for just a second and show you something. Bring your crowns. Bring your crowns. Yes, we have King Connor and Queen Katie of McGee the royal family standing right amongst us. We are so honored today. <laughs> now, King Connor, he is the supreme leader of Michigan. Land. He has the authority to carry out any decision he makes. <laughs> but he also gave something to Queen Katie. Now, this is what I want you guys to see. He gave her the authority to operate in his name. See, Katie was this ordinary girl from Minnesota before she met Prince Charming here. Before he became king, she didn't, <laughs> she had no crown. <laughs> she had no crown on her head. She had no authority to operate in at all in the land of McGee. <laughs> <laughs> But here's Queen Katie's part, because he gave her now authority to operate his name. She has a heart to love her king and to serve him with everything that's in her, to love him and honor him. And so she can represent him and his name faithfully and with a power that he trusts. Amen? See, this is like God in us. And it honestly, okay, Brendan, since you laughed so hard, come up here a second. <laughs> <laughs> the other brother. Honestly, what Jesus does for us is he takes his crown off. <laughs> <laughs> And he puts it on our head. No, you don't get the right. <laughs> See, what Jesus does, you guys, is he literally, he literally takes his crown and puts it on us. He takes the crown of his love and his mercy and puts it on us so we can reign, so we can be a leader in our life, so we have everything we need to be a success, to do things in his direction and under his protection. 
you guys think that you can sit down. And Brendan, yeah, he'll want the crown back. <laughs> I want to close up today. Because what I've illustrated up here, you guys, is like a Disney fairy tale. And Max, I'm so sorry for you that you live with two sisters because um, you probably have to watch <laughs> lots of those princess movies. Princesses and Barbies, yeah. I feel for you, man. But what I kind of presented to you guys was like a fairy tale. You know, all the Disney fairy tales that we've ever watched in our life, there's these words that come across the screen at the very end. And they lived happily ever after. Crock of poop. <laughs> Sorry. God does want each one of you to live happily ever after. But what we never see in the Disney fairy tales is what happens after they say, I do, and they kiss the, the handsome prince, and they walk off into La La Land with the happily ever after rolling across the screen. Life happens. Stuff happens. Difficult circumstances. People issues. Relationship issues. And you know what? In 1 John, it says that the perfect love of Jesus casts out of fear. Most every time that we have an issue, that we're having a difficult time dealing with it, it has a root in that thing called fear. I'm afraid I'm not going to be accepted. I'm afraid this isn't going to work out. I'm afraid I'm not going to have enough money. I'm afraid, I'm afraid, I'm afraid, I'm afraid. We sang that today, you guys. I'm no longer a slave to fear. The love of God inside of our life frees us from fear. No matter what the issue we're facing, no matter what the difficulty that's happening in your life, no matter what, his love, his love pushes out of you. It doesn't leave you the same. It doesn't leave you in the place. And he doesn't say, well, you go figure it out and live happily ever after. He says, I'm joined with you forever. I'm never leaving you. My love, my mercy, it's with you every step of the way. I'm here protecting you. I'm here directing you. I'm here. And we're going to do this together. You're ruling and reigning in your life as an extension of the Lord Jesus Christ. Him living out through you. That's the coolest thing ever. He just doesn't drop you here and say, Verlie, go figure this out and live your life. And if you mess up, I don't care. He doesn't leave you there. He cares about every little detail of our life. And when we get in fear, you guys, we try to control. We try to control what happens to us. We try to put up walls. We try to block people out. We try to keep God out. I'm afraid if I let him in, what's really going to happen? What's he going to do? Am I going to be the same person anymore? But he's always outside that door of that wall, knocking, saying, I'm right here. I love you. My mercies are new every morning. I'm here. Let's do this together. Let's rule. Let's lead your life. You don't have to do it on your own. I'm right here with you. I put a crown on your head so you can be the leader of your life with my ability. So today as Katie plays, I'm going to pray, and if you guys, any one of you in here, what I've spoken here in the last couple of minutes has a tug at your heart. That fear is gripping you or you're challenged with my life's just spinning out of control let's pray let's agree Brennan and Kayla can you guys come up here I'm going to ask these two to be up front here I'm going to close in prayer 
And then I'm going to ask if any one of you has a need. And you know, I've said this before. I've pulled these two up before. You know, the age of a person doesn't matter in if they can pray and believe God with you. And these two have a gift in their hearts to believe and to step out of faith. So if you have something in your life that you want prayer for, I want you to come up here and I want you to see one of those two. And I want you to not leave before you get that taken care of. Okay? Now let's pray and let's close. Jesus, we're so grateful. We're so grateful, Lord Jesus, for your love and your tender mercy. That even though you know what we're made of, even you know, though you know we fall and we mess up, that you have mercy that's never ending, that's new every morning. We thank you, Lord Jesus, that you've joined yourself to us, that, that you never leave us, that you're never going to say, do this on your own. You're right there with us every step of the way. That through your word and, and through your voice speaking inside of us, Lord Jesus, we can be directed. And Jesus, we just we just come today knowing that fear has no place here. Knowing that each one of us has the right to freedom, has the right to live a life free from that torment of sin and shame. So Jesus, I just ask that you work in hearts today. As you'd inspire us, that you would pull us forward, that you would draw us to yourself. That we'd have a hunger for your word and a depth of knowing you that we've never had before. Jesus, just work in our hearts. We give you permission today. We give you permission to work in our hearts. We love you, Jesus.